Well, it really is good to be here. It's, uh, I mean, what a crowd. It's great. Uh, I know that, I guess that's all in the context of wherever you're used to being. Uh, for some people, this is like, this is a lot in this room, but for us, this is just a lot, period, no matter what space we're in. So this is great. Um, really appreciate that. Obviously, there are some like things where we have to try to figure out how we're going to space out the best we can and stuff, but I think the, the key phrase that we've been using for over a year now is the best we can, and so it all seems to kind of work out, and just thankful for everyone's patience with some of that. Um, really appreciate everyone that's led so far, the songs, the prayers, the scripture readings. Um, definitely appreciate the, the thoughts that Josh had for the Lord's before we partake of the Lord's Supper and just getting our minds in the right place, what it means to examine ourselves. I never thought of that connection in 2 Corinthians 13, so that was, that was great. I appreciate that a lot. Um, we're going to be wrapping up our series on the churches in Asia, or the, the letters to the churches in Asia that we see in Revelation today. So if you want to turn to Revelation 3, we're going to be looking at Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22. This is primarily where, where we're going to look today. We might go to a couple of other scriptures. And this has been two months coming that we've been looking at this. And so I'm glad to, not to be done with it, that sounds bad. I'm glad to, to finish it up, to wrap it up, and to move on to something else. It's been really helpful for me to look at this. And I hope it's been helpful for you if you've been able to be part of a couple of the lessons and just uh, listen and maybe do your own study. But before we get into what Jesus says to Laodicea, I do want to go through a few things just as a way of reminder for us. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at just where this is. So if you look at the map that's up here, it might be a little jumbled, but maybe it's clean enough to where you can see it. And you can see that John was on Patmos. So he's stranded on an island because of persecution. He writes this letter. Well, he gets this vision from Jesus, and he writes this whole letter. And then he, within this letter, there are specific letters to each of these churches. And there's going to be messengers that are going to take the letters to each church. But I do think that there's something interesting that, that is possible, which is that each church might be seeing the whole letter of Revelation in totality, which means if Ephesus knows what's going on in Laodicea. Laodicea knows what's going on in Pergamum. They all know each other's business. And we don't like our dirty laundry to be out there, right? Well, maybe some people like it because they like attention, but most of us that... Uh, we don't like that, right? Um, or we're okay with certain things being out there. We, we don't want everything out there. But each church knows what Jesus is saying to the other churches. And so it's going to start there in Ephesus, and it's going to work its way around in a circle. So that means that today we're wrapping up in Laodicea. It's come full circle, and then we're going to be done with looking at the churches here. With each church, Jesus has some good things to say about almost all of them, except for the one we're going to look at today. And for some of the church, he has some bad things to say, some things of critique, some things of calling for repentance. So what we've been saying is that each church is either in a status of being faithful, unfaithful, or a mixed bag. And the reason we say that is not that we judge that they are faithful or unfaithful, but Jesus is revealing what he sees in each of these churches. So it starts with the first church is unfaithful. He doesn't say that some are faithful and some are not. He just tells the whole church to repent. So he does that with Ephesus, and he does that with Laodicea. Then with the, with the second one and the sixth one, he doesn't call for repentance at all. With the whole church, he just encourages them to continue in steadfastness and faithfulness. Continue to be faithful even in the midst of persecution. And in the middle three, he says that some need to repent, and some need to continue to be faithful. So when, when you see that, that's... In literature, I guess, or in, um, yeah, in literature, that's going to be like a chiastic structure. And I'm not big on grammar even. I mean, I'm from Alabama, so, you know, uh, we don't do too well with those things. So, uh, or too good. I don't know what the right one is. So with the middle ones, when you see the chiastic structure, it's meant to draw attention to what's in the middle. So the cool thing here is that in the middle, when we talked about some being faithful, some not faithful within the church, within these churches, I think the point of that is to say that's where most of us are going to see, or most of our churches are going to see our identity is we got some good things and we have some things that need to be worked on. So when we look at our church, we've been trying to think, where do we fit into this? Hopefully we're not like Ephesus. Hopefully we're not Laodicea. There's a good chance that we're somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis area. But we need to be able to examine ourselves 
individually and examine this group and see where are we. So that's been our purpose and that's been our goal. With each church, Jesus has made a promise. He said you can still conquer. Even if you need to repent, you can still conquer. You, there is a reward. There is a promise that is there. And then later on in Revelation, Jesus reveals what that promise actually looks like in the grand scheme of things. So there's a fulfillment later on in Revelation of each of these promises that he has made to these churches. So let's go ahead and look at the, the actual letter that he writes to Laodicea. So in Laodicea, you might remember, if there's one church that most people remember, it's Laodicea. Because there's the whole image of being lukewarm and Jesus spewing them out of, their, out of his mouth, right? Which is just a really crazy thought that Jesus is like, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. I want to spew you out. Um, it's just kind of gross. But that's what Jesus says to this church. And I think we're going to talk about that. But really, what I want to focus on is what he says later on. His message to them, I think, is summed up in just a few words, which is to be zealous and repent. So let's go ahead and look at the letter. Let's go ahead and read in Revelation 3, starting in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may, may see." Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. A few things we've been noticing in each of these letters. Jesus describes himself at the beginning of each letter. He goes on to say that I know your works, and he sometimes details some good things, like I know your works that you bear that you don't bear with false teaching. I know your works that you show love and faithfulness, and, and he goes on and on. But with this church, he doesn't do that. He says, I know your works, and then he doesn't say anything good after that. He also brings up things that are kind of unique to this, to this area, maybe even to the city historically. So we'll talk about that with Laodicea. He does that with most of the churches. With several of them, he says to repent, like we see here in verse 19, that they need to repent. But then after that, with each church, he gives them a promise. He says, you can still be a conqueror, you can still be victorious, and here's what you can look forward to. So let's go ahead and, and look at, at this church. And first, we're going to start with how does Jesus describe himself? Well, so he describes himself as the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. So Jesus is the amen. So we've said amen several times here today or most people have at least. And when we say that, we mean yes, or I agree, right? I never knew that growing up. I, I just thought amen was, I don't know, it was how you wrapped up the prayer. It's kind of like a see you later or goodbye. Or, I didn't know what it was, you know, but, but I knew that I only heard like a deep bass, you know, amen, that kind of thing. And like, that's all I knew growing up. But that means I agree. I concur. Yes. Let it be so. Jesus says this a lot of times in his teaching, like when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, things like that. That's meant to draw attention to what he's saying, that he is trustworthy. Like he's, he's saying, yes, yes, I'm saying to you. That, it's kind of like the same as, as people saying amen, really. Jesus is the amen. He is the yes. He is the ultimate fulfillment to all of God's promises. He is the embodiment of, of amen. So when we say amen, we mean I agree. Jesus is the agreement and the conclusion and everything to Jesus' promises in his word, which means that everything he says is true and faithful. So like, for instance, when we look down in Revelation or we look back in Revelation 1 and we see how John sees Jesus in Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5 and in verse 16, it takes us to this place of realizing Jesus is the true one. He is the faithful one. But then in verse 16, everything he says, everything that comes out of his mouth is this sword, this double-edged sword, right? That means it's trustworthy, it's true, there's no denying it. Now, what that also meant when we looked at that uh, several weeks ago was that it cuts, kind of going in and going out, that kind of idea. But everything Jesus says to this church can be trusted. He also says that he is the beginning of creation, the beginning of God's creation. So 
I think one side point is when we read that, I think some people could read that and get confused and say, does that mean he was the first created being by God? And I think that more what we need to look at is back in John 1, 1 through 3, where, where John describes Jesus as being in the beginning with creation, that through him all was created. He is the beginning of creation, not the first created one. He was at the beginning of creation is really what he's saying. So Jesus tells this church, I am the amen. I am faithful and true. And I have been here since the beginning. What that should do is cause him to listen up. Like he shouldn't have to prove himself. He doesn't have to make any sort of grand argument and a grand case for what he's about to say. Whatever he says can be trusted. I don't trust hardly anything that people say unless like it's already something I know or I have to admit that they just have a ton more knowledge on a specific subject than me. And I don't like that feeling because that causes humility, right? And most of us don't like that feeling. But when it comes to their spiritual state, they might think one thing and Jesus is going to say another thing. And it's going to be up to them whether they listen, whether they trust him or not. So Jesus is presenting himself as one that can be trusted. So this is the image we've been looking at uh, each week with what, what was it that John saw in Revelation 1? When Laodicea is supposed to get the mental picture of Jesus, this is something kind of like what they're supposed to see. Something kind of like. I don't know exactly what it was. But this is the idea, right? But the specific aspect that they should be looking at is not everything around. Because what Jesus says about himself is that I am the one. I am the amen. I am the faithful and true one. And look at the sword coming out of his mouth. Everything he says is true and can be trusted. That's what they're supposed to see. So let's talk about the city of Laodicea itself. Because with, the, with most of these churches, the city seems to have an impact on the church to where the church actually kind of reflects the city a little bit. But we'll talk about the hot and cold in a second, but, but I do want to kind of historically go through and say that I think the reason that Jesus says this about the hot and cold is because of the geography. There was a city that was about six or seven miles north called Hierapolis. It was known for its hot springs and hot water. Okay. Then there was a city, Colossae, which we know Colossians is the letter written to that church. So the city Colossae was about 10 miles south, and it's known for cold water. So they would try to get aqueducts and everything so they can get water into the city. And wouldn't you know it, they just get this hot and cold mixture that keeps coming together. So no matter what they do, they have lukewarm water in the city. They're known for bad water, basically, is what happens. So that's what Laodicea historically is known for. Another thing they're known for is that they had a really strong economy. They were rich people. Not to say everyone was rich, but as a city, they were very rich, very well off. In fact, there was apparently an earthquake back in AD 60. And whereas most cities would have to get help from Rome, they didn't need any help. Like Rome offered to help repay, uh, help pay for stuff for it to be rebuilt. And they said, no, we're good. We don't, we don't need anything. We have a strong enough economy. So they're, they're a financial center, a, a banking center, things like that. They're also um, they're known for like textiles and clothing, specifically black wool apparently was known uh, for, to be from there. So they were a very unique group, very unique city, I'm sorry, to where they didn't need Rome. They had clothing that would stand out amongst everybody. And lastly, that they were known as being a center for medicine, specifically medicine for their eyes. Did you notice what Jesus says to them? We'll talk about this more in a little bit. But he says, you're wretched, you're pitiable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Right? And he says, you need to come to me to get rich, to be clothed, and so you can see. So I really do think that this church wound up reflecting the city that they were part of. Do you think we can do that? Do you think we can reflect the city we're part of? Like, the things that we notice that are not great about Atlanta, is it possible that without meaning to, we let that seep in, and it can be part of who we are? I think that's very possible. I think that's what this church did. So it seems like that the city didn't want help from Rome and then these Christians didn't want help from Christ eventually. They stopped relying on him. So what I want to do is I want to spend the rest of our time just going through four lessons from this, this letter that Jesus gives to this church. And the first one is that Jesus has no room for lukewarm Christians. He has no use for them. He doesn't want them. They're useless to him. 
And that sounds like so harsh. As I was typing it out, I was like, can I rephrase that? Because that sounds harsh. But Jesus says it himself. He's going to spit them out of his mouth. Why, why should I rephrase something that Jesus says? So he has nothing good to say about this church, but there's still hope. I want to toss that out and just make sure we're remembering that. There's still hope. They can still be conquerors. Unlike Ephesus, where Jesus says that they have some sort of faithfulness in the fact that they don't put up a false teaching, he has nothing good to say about this church. Like, I know your works, and you disgust me. That's what he says. So because they're lukewarm, he said, I wish you were hot or cold. So I want to talk for a second about what I think that means. I, I don't know what, what everyone might think that it means to be hot or cold, but I don't think Jesus is saying it would be better if you were cold and like not faithful at all or didn't act like you were Christians. I just wish you didn't even act like it. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying because that's how I grew up kind of hearing it. Like it's you, you're hot, you're on fire for God, you're faithful, you're cold, you're distant, all that stuff. And lukewarm is in the middle where you're acting it out like you're a, you're a hypocrite, basically. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I think he's, this is really just a play on words based on the city and, and the cold springs and the hot springs that merge together in Laodicea. It's good to be hot and it's good to be cold in this setting. It's unacceptable to be, to be lukewarm. So I don't think that Jesus is, is saying that he wishes they were just not faking it, that kind of thing. I think he's saying you're lukewarm. Yeah, you're, you're playing the part, and I wish that you were just something more. Be, be more pure. Stop being this lukewarm mixture, right? So I, I spent some time trying to figure out what that meant to be lukewarm. And I, I tried to think, like, would Jesus say that to us? Would he say, you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold? And I thought... Well, it's kind of funny because this group actually is very sensitive to temperature, uh, like our members are. <laughs> Richard is seemingly never hot, and I am seemingly never cold. Kelly is seemingly never hot, and I think Tim is seemingly never cold, it seems. like. So in this group, we could take that and be like, oh, we don't have that problem. We're good. So he's obviously not talking about the temperature of the building or the body temperature of the members. So we do have to worry about this. This is something that we should take notice of and think about ourselves. So what does it look like to be lukewarm? So here just, here's just a list of some things for us to think about. Lukewarm people can attend worship regularly, but when they come to worship, they come because they have to, not because they're committed to the Lord. But they can still be there, take up seats. That's possible. That, that could be us. Lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from, the, from their sins. They just want to escape the penalty of their sins. Lukewarm people gauge their godliness by being better than the world around them, like Josh said. They don't gauge their godliness according to God. They just focus on being a little bit better than the people around them. Lukewarm people say they love Jesus and that Jesus is part of their life, but he's not their whole life. Lukewarm Christians are willing to sacrifice, but only what's left over or what they can do without, which really isn't much of a sacrifice. Lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more often than they think about eternity in heaven. Lukewarm people don't believe that the new life in Christ is better than the old sinful life, so there's always this tug and pull of, I wish I could go back mentality. Lukewarm people rarely sh share their faith with their neighbors or anyone around because they're afraid of being rejected, and the truth is that they're not even totally bought in themselves. It's too uncomfortable. And they're not passionate enough about what they're part of, about their faith, to say that they truly believe in it anyway. And Jesus says he's going to vomit them out. He says he's going to spew them out in verse 16. They disgust him, and he can't stand their lukewarmness. And instead of thinking about people you remember, like, growing up, or people you know right now, like, yep, that person over there, like, this is meant to, for us to self-diagnose us. We don't start with everyone around us. We start with ourselves, and then we think about our group. So we don't want to be lukewarm. Jesus wants them to be hot or cold. We need to make sure that we're not lukewarm, that we don't have that spirit in us, that we don't act that way, that we don't, we don't spread that among our group. We need to be passionate and zealous. That's actually the next thing that I want to point out, is that we need more zeal for God. This group has so much, so the more we have in this life, the more we need zeal for God. Jesus says, here are some things that you have been saying. Now, whether they said it out loud or they thought it, or he just knows their heart, so he's bringing out what's in their heart, I don't know. 
But in verse 17, he says, you say I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing. That's like a, that's such a crazy thing for a Christian to say, for a Christian to think, especially in relation to Christ. Who would ever think, I don't need anything, God. I'm prosperous, I'm rich, I'm good. I, I think we might think that. I think we, we might act that way sometimes. There's a very real chance that we think this way, and we say this in our heart, and we don't even realize it. Look, we live in the United States. We live in a big city. It's not the biggest city, but it is a big city. We could be Laodicea. We're like, if something happens here, we're like, oh, no, we're good. We don't need help from anyone. And we have that mentality where if anything happens in our lives, God, we're good. I don't need your help, okay? I can do this. I remember when I was in college, I was hit with the reality that I have to reach out to people sometimes because I was broke. And my mom called me and said, Blake, have you looked at your bank account lately? And I was like, no. And this was before, this is I'm really old, I uh, just realized that. This was before I think you could check your balance easily online. And like, actually, I don't even think they had an app for banking at the time. If they did, I didn't know about it. I think I had a BlackBerry, so I, didn't, I don't know. They didn't have anything like they have now. I was like, no, I have no idea. And she was like, you owe three hundred and fifty dollars to the bank you're like you're you're in the hole i was like oh well uh she's like do you have that i was like well obviously not mom <laughs> like i would put it in there if i had it i no i don't have that the problem was i knew for like two months that that was coming but i just thought i'll dig myself out i'll make it happen i'll work more i'll spend less i'll do this i'll do that right and then you all of a sudden you get that phone call and it's like well i need help I can't do this on my own. And I wonder if that's what we do with God. I wonder if we do that in a way where we go for months where our prayers are not reflecting a true reliance on God until we're in a pit, until we're in a hole, we've dug ourselves too deep, and then it's like, God, save me. Where the whole time he's wanting to provide everything that we need. He's wanting to give us the riches that we need. He's wanting to give us the clothing. He's wanting us to give everything. And we just have been saying, it's okay, I'll make it happen. Or let's say that sin that we're struggling with, it, we're giving it a temptation over and over and over again. I got this, God. I can do this. I don't need help from my brothers and sisters. I'm not going to confess openly. I'm not even going to confess privately or anything like that. And in, in a way, we're not even confessing to God. We're not even saying we need his help. And we're confessing to him we need help. We're just like, I'm going to own this. I'm going to set up certain things. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to conquer this. We lose, when we lose our self-reliance, we lose our zeal for God. Self-sufficiency stops reliance on God. Jesus says that this church needs zeal. So the word zeal apparently is very closely related to the word being jealous, right? He's saying, I want you to be jealous for God. I want you to want him, to desire him, to pursue him. Be zealous for God and repent. Stop relying on yourself so much. And I think that in the U.S. today especially, we need that message in this group that we need to be zealous for God. We need to stop thinking that we can take care of it, that we have all we need, that we can make it happen, or that, well, I'll figure it out. I mean, I, I, I felt that so much about my faith. I'll figure a way out. I thought that so much when sin just kept on, like, I don't know, just swallowing me up. I just thought, I'll figure it out. And then eventually you just wake up and you're in a hole. And instead of my mom calling, it was just like I looked around and I was just like, this is terrible. Like, I'm in, I'm in debt up to my eyeballs right now. I don't know what to do. And the only solution is to repent. I think that's why Jesus says this to this church. Be zealous and repent. The only solution for us is that we need to enlist our help of our brethren. And we need to truly go to the source and go to God for all that we need. Jesus says that he's going to provide everything that they need. He says, I'll give you riches. I'll give you clothing. Your eyes, like you can't really see very well. I got the medicine for that. The, the funny thing is, when he says, I counsel you, we should probably look at that and think Jesus is presenting himself as the great physician right here. Where he's actually saying, like, you have a problem. Here, here, here's your problem. Here's your diagnosis. Here are the symptoms, all that stuff. And boom, I got the medicine for you. And the medicine for them is be zealous and turn to me. That's what he's saying. So he counsels them. 
like a physician that provides for, for, his, uh, for his patients. Let's go back to Isaiah 55 real quick. I want to turn to Isaiah 55 and notice something that God says here. So this isn't new. This isn't something that just Christians uh, in Laodicea needed to hear. This is something that people of God for all time need to remember. In Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 1, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Okay, how, how do you buy and eat when you have no money? Like, I remember eating nothing for a few days and only drinking Hawaiian punch when I was in college because I had no money. No one was saying, oh, come on with your money that you don't have and eat. No restaurant was saying that. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's how you get it because it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to, act, you, you know how the whole idea is like your money's no good here kind of thing. Not because they don't want you to be a patron of the place, but it's like, I got it. I think that's what God is saying here. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. What he is telling these people is the same thing Jesus is saying. He's saying, you need to come to me for bread. You need to come to me for clothing. You need to come to me to be filled, to be clothed, and to be healthy. If you try to do it yourself, you're going to wind up being poor, naked, and blind. That's what Laodicea had done. They didn't realize how poor they were. They didn't realize how naked they were. They didn't realize how blind they were. Because they thought they had it all. And really, most of that is because they were gauging their spiritual wellness by their physical wealth. That's just a very dangerous thing for us to do. And the last thing that I want to point out is that Jesus wants fellowship with us and to share his glory with us. So he actually says in verse 20, back in Revelation 3, I stand at the door and knock. And he wants to be let in. And he doesn't want to be let in so he can look around and be like, all right, well, Everything looks good. All right, I'll see you all later, right? That's not what he does. He's not like a landlord that just wants to make sure you haven't busted a hole in the wall. He wants to come in and eat with you. He wants to, you to eat with him. He wants to sit at the dinner table and share a meal. But it's a continual meal. I think this, this picture is a picture of continued fellowship, and that's what Jesus wants with his people. That's what he wants with all people. So he wants that with Laodicea. Apparently they're not opening the door, though. But then he says that the one who conquers, which there is a chance still for them to conquer, there is hope still, that they will be granted the opportunity to sit with Jesus on his throne. That doesn't mean we rule with him like we're co-rulers, like he's the king, but he shares his glory with us. We sit there with him in his glory on his throne. And he compares that to when he sat down on the throne with his father. He humbled himself and came to this earth, and he lived amongst men. And then after all was completed, all was fulfilled on this earth, he ascended back to the Father, and he sat down with the Father. And he's inviting us to do the same. He's inviting us to go through all the stuff here like he went through, and to ascend to him, and to sit with him in glory. And then... He says at the end, which he says to almost every church, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's how he wraps up. He wraps up this letter to Laodicea and to all these churches by giving a picture of shared fellowship and shared glory with the Savior, with Jesus Christ. Conquerors get to sit with Jesus on his throne. They can be like Jesus in his triumph over sin and death and glory. And he wants his people to be with him in glory forever for all eternity let's go to revelation 21 this will be the last passage we look at revelation 21 and we'll read verses 5 through 7 revelation 21 starting verse 5 and who he who was seated on the throne said behold i am making all things new also he said write this down for these words are trustworthy and true and he said to me it is done i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. 
What a beautiful picture. This brings up so much that Jesus said from Laodicea right there in those three verses. He is the true one and trustworthy one. He's the Alpha and Omega from the beginning. If we're thirsty, he will offer up these good springs, not this lukewarm water. He will offer up this good spring of, of water that we can drink from for free forever. And we'll be sons and daughters of God forever. All we can want will be ours because of what Jesus went through. He says they can be clothed because they were, he, they, he was stripped of his own clothing. They can be rich because he gave up all the riches in heaven to be poor and humble. And they can see because Jesus came to give sight to the blind. So I think the message for us is that Jesus stands at the door knocking. And the question is, will we open that door? And will, will we allow him to come in? I'm not saying come into our hearts and we're good. I'm saying come in and be in fellowship with us now and forever. If we want that, the two main things that we need to do, be zealous for him and repent. So if that applies to you today, then that means that you need to make a change. You need to be zealous for God. You need to have a change of heart. You need to repent of your ways. You need to confess and humble yourself and don't be prideful and think that you got it covered, you're good, you don't need any help. You do need help. But open the door. Jesus wants to be let in. And look forward to the glory, not on this earth, but the glory forever with God in his throne room. We'll have a song. If anyone needs prayers, this group is here to pray for you. Reach out to someone individually if you need that. Don't let a day pass of thinking that, well, I'll sleep on it. No, if you need help and you need prayers, you need to do something. If you need to repent, you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins because you've been thinking about that for a while, we want help with that too. If anyone's subject to the invitation, feel free to let someone know. You can let me know as I'm at my seat as we stand and as we sing the song that Tim has prepared for us.